Welcome to our bonus episode on Gideon. Today, as we've uh, begun to do, uh, we'll just give a little bit more information on Gideon that really would not fit into the Sunday morning sermon. Um, some of these things we have mentioned in the devotionals, but um, review the devotionals for additional information. I'm not going to go back over that, uh, the things that we talked about there. The first thing that I wanted to mention, uh, Gideon's story runs from 6 through chapter 9, and we only looked at chapter 7. It's interesting to me that in chapter 6, Gideon asks, for two signs. Now one of them is obvious and that occurs in um, chapter 6 uh, verse 33 Gideon sounds the horn and calls warriors from Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali and 32,000 warriors come. After they come Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. And uh, there we have the story of the fleece. But actually, that's the second time Gideon asks for a sign in chapter 6. The first time comes when the angel of the Lord, which uh, I believe is a theophany, it's God himself appearing to Gideon, tells Gideon that he's going to use him, Gideon actually says in verse 17, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign. Now the sign that the Lord provided Gideon was Gideon brought an offering, a goat that uh, Gideon prepared for an offering with broth. And... Uh, the angel of the Lord said, put the goat on that rock. He did. Pour the broth over it. He did. And then the angel of the Lord touched the rock and flames burst up, uh, consumed the offering. And the angel of the Lord stepped into the flames and he was also gone. Um, it seems unusual to ask for signs like this. And yet it's fairly common in the Old Testament. Do you remember Moses? When the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush and said, I want you to go and call my people out of, out of Egypt, Moses said, show me a sign. And the sign that he got was to lay his rod on the ground. It turned into a snake. And then the Lord said, pick it up by the tail. Uh, problem with that is it leaves the business end of the snake free. Moses did, and it became his staff, his rod again. Asking for signs is not overly common, but it's certainly not unknown in the Old Testament. What I gain from that is that God wants us to know his will. God wants us to see what it is that he wants us to do, and he's willing to do that. I think that God, even today, if we dare ask him for a sign, I think the Lord helps. Uh, I've heard stories of people who have struggled with, am I supposed to go on a mission trip to Columbia or not, and suddenly... Uh, in the news, it's Columbia. They pick up the paper, it's Columbia. They open their Bible and the Lord says, go to the Southland. Uh, <laughs> things like that, that the Lord just seems to indicate to them. Yes, this is what I want you to do. God's desire is for us to know His will. 
Now, the second thing that I notice in chapter 6 is that Gideon builds two altars. And he does it within a 24-hour period. Uh, The first altar he builds at the site that uh, the offering to the angel of the Lord was consumed. And Gideon called that altar Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. And that still stands in uh, Ophrah to the day of the writing of the book of Judges. The second altar the Lord had Gideon build when he tore down the altar to Baal and the Asherah pole. Now just a little bit of explanation about that. The altar to Baal may have been a place where sacrifices could be made, but it almost certainly included uh, the image of a bull. Um, In uh, ancient Near East mythology, Baal was the god of thunderbolts, and he is typically pictured as standing, riding, standing uh, erect on top of a bull, throwing bolts of lightning. Um, The bull was an image of Baal, and almost certainly there was an image of Baal that was included here. The Asherah pole or the Ashtarot, uh, both refer to the same thing. Uh, They would take a tree that had a straight trunk. They would strip it of all of its branches, strip it of its bark, and with that tree make a phallic symbol. Uh, Baal and Ashtarot were to be uh, husband and wife. They were brother and sister but uh, they were sexually active. And actually, the worship of Baal and Ashtaroth included the use of temple prostitutes, male and female, depending on who came with the sacrifice. So this was especially abominable to the people of Israel. Uh, Gideon chopped down the Asherah pole, used the wood then to sacrifice Another on another altar that Gideon built, this time to the Lord in Ophrah. We'll come back to that in the last thing that we mentioned today. Third thing that I wanted to mention uh, in chapter 7, we pretty much went over the story of how uh, Gideon uh, and the 300 men Uh, were used by God to bring victory over the Midianites. But in the passage in chapter 8, Gideon, in chasing uh, a a certain segment of the Midianites with the 300 men that he had, now probably armed with swords, not just with uh, ram's horns and torches, he comes to the city of, of uh, Sukkoth and he asks them for food for his 300 men and they refuse. He goes to Peniel, a nearby town. He asks for the same. We're hungry. We're uh, tired after pursuing the enemy and they refuse. This is a breakdown in what Israel was to do. Israel was to lend aid to its brother tribes. But uh, Gideon crosses the Jordan River into the area of Manasseh that was on the east side of the Jordan River, and they refused to help. Interesting. It's a breakdown in what God wanted Israel to do. And so after pursuing the enemy, Uh, We read in verse 16 that Gideon came back. He found a young man from Sukkoth. He said, uh, give me the names of the leaders. He did. He looked them all up by name. And in verse 16, Gideon took the elders of the town and he taught them a lesson, punishing them with thorns and briars from the wilderness. He whipped them with thorns and briars. 
Then he went to Peniel, tore down the tower, and killed all the men in the town. Um, whether this is right or not, uh, I'm not sure. God does not explicitly say to Gideon, punish the elders of Sukkoth, kill the men of Peniel. Gideon does, and he does it to punish them. I think the author of Judges is also showing us the extent to which we have a breakdown in Israel. Now Gideon and his small army are fighting against Israel, fighting against a tribe of Israel. The last thing that I want to mention starts in verse 22 of chapter 8. The men come to Gideon and say, be our ruler. He says, no, that's, that's not for me. I led the army. That's all the farther I want to go. And he didn't accept becoming the ruler, but he did say, just uh, share the booty with me. And he said, that's fine. Everybody threw in a gold earring that they had taken from the enemy. And uh, with it, Gideon made an ephod. Now, it's unclear exactly what the ephod was. Some think that it may have been an image. But the word ephod is actually used earlier in the book of Exodus. Chapter 28, Moses is told to make Aaron an ephod. Verse 6, the craftsman must make an ephod of finely woven linen and skillfully embroider it with gold. So the ephod was a piece of clothing to which was attached a golden breastplate. And the chief priest was to carry that ephod any time he entered the temple except on the Day of Atonement. Um, that's a story for a different uh, podcast. But he would carry the ephod, which was a symbol of God's presence with him. Now Gideon made an ephod. God's presence was in the tabernacle in Shiloh. In the book of Joshua, chapter 18, verse 1, we're told that the tabernacle, now that the land was under Israelite control, the entire community of Israel gathered at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle. That was to be the place that they would go to consult the Lord. But Gideon set up an ephod and he put it in Ophrah, his hometown. Now, one of the things that the ephod was used for, um, Exodus 28, verse 30, insert the Urim and Thummim into the sacred chess place, chess piece, so that they'll be carried over Aaron's heart when he goes into the Lord's presence. So the ephod which held the breastplate, Urim and Thummim, was to go inside the chess plate. In this way, Aaron will always carry over his heart the objects used to determine the Lord's will for his people whenever he goes in before the Lord. Many people think that what Gideon was doing was providing uh, his tribe a place close by to go to ask for God's will. Instead of going to Shiloh, again, I think the author of uh, Judges is trying to indicate the extent to which the breakdown continues. Instead of going to Shiloh to consult the Lord, Gideon sets up something that they can consult the Lord with in Ophrah. An ephod, perhaps with an Urim and Thummim, six-sided die, that uh, they would be able to consult God uh, at their own hometown instead of going to Shiloh and the priests. No matter what, we do read in verse 27, 
Judges 8, 27. Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold and he put it in Ophrah's hometown. But soon all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it. It became a trap for Gideon and his family. Gideon's intention may not have been to create an idol to worship, but Israel was in the habit of worshiping things other than God. They continued that habit by worshiping the ephod. Maybe uh, Gideon put the ephod over the image of a man, in essence a mannequin, and Israel began to worship that as an idol, saying, this is what delivered us from the Midianites. Gideon's story didn't end well. Gideon and his sons uh, had a bad end. In the devotionals, we talk about that a little bit. It's important for us to finish well. One of the uh, things that I've observed after years of ministry is that frequently, when people have a very successful ministry, maybe something they've planned for months, even for years, and they pull it off, and it's a great success, they let their guard down, and the enemy comes in. Sometimes they confront uh, an enemy, uh, uh, whether that's uh, something that is trying to destroy the church, and they successfully combat that, and they let their guard down. Let's be careful not to let our guard down. Let's be careful to finish well. I hope you've enjoyed this bonus episode about Gideon. Like, follow, or subscribe on whatever platform you use to listen to this presentation. Share it with your friends. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday when we'll talk about Jephthah.